My name is Pinchas Gutta, and I was born in Lodge in 1932. My father's name was Menachem Mendel Yonatan Gutta. My mother's name was Chaya Yenta Gutta, but everybody called her Helena. I had a twin sister. Her name was Shifra Trana Gutta. Everybody called her Sabina. That's the courtyard. That's the courtyard. That's the building. 74 years ago, I left this house in 1939 to go to Warsaw. And since then, this is the first time that I'm looking at the ruins of a place where I was a very, very happy child, where I was born, where I had my, my circumcision, where I spent many, at least seven and a half, eight years of a happy childhood. My father's name was Menachem Mendel Gutter. He was a very religious Jew, and he was a member of the Gere Hasidim, very close to the Geru Rebbe, who, who was in Gura Kalvaria, which was called Ger by the Jews. And every Yontev, my father used to leave us alone here with my grandfather, and he used to go to the Rebbe. Jewish community was made out of tradesmen. They were either textile makers or, or they were tailors, shoemakers and stuff like that. But they also were metal workers and glaciers. They used to put window glass. And every day other people used to come around to this yard and they used to shout, sharpening of knives, windows, repairing windows, and all different things that were going on. And also beggars. Beggars used to come and said, throw us a couple of groschen, because a grosh was a lot of money. Five groschen, you could buy yourself. I remember that for five groschen, you could buy a very huge ice cream. So, you know, this, is, uh, this, this was a lot of money. So people used to throw from the, from the windows, people used to give tzedukah. My grandfather was a very uh, generous man. When he used to leave to go to work, he would take out all the money that he had and he would stack it up next to the, the door and take all his small change and put it up. And then he said, when a beggar comes, because they used to come around ring the bell, and you give them, I don't know, one groschen, two groschen, and when the money is finished and if they're hungry, you go to the kitchen and you give them some food. And this happened on a regular basis. And these are the type of uh, uh, memories that I have from actually living in this particular place.
Uh, I remember it as a small child coming here, you know, with my nanny. And I enjoyed myself in this park because this park was really a place where we used to come and play quite often. Both my sister and I used to come here and uh, we'd have a great time. We'd run around, we, we played games. On a Saturday, during the day, you saw here, you know, Yidden with streimels, with their wives, you know, with their scheitels, and beautifully dressed with the children running around, going spazieren, and there was a synagogue not far from, there were two actually in this area. And when people used to go home, have uh, supper, have a little sleep, and then come out and go spazieren before Shalashidis, it was marvelous. But today it's not here, it's gone. There are no Jews, there's no Shabbat, it's just, it's all gone like the Jews are gone. You know, my mother and I used to go often to the park. And one day we walked out and we were walking to the park. My mother was dressed beautifully. You know, she was blonde, she was blue eyed. She, she was magnificently dressed. She looked like a Scandinavian model. And as we were walking towards the park, uh, a man came from the other side walking towards us. As he came towards us, he stopped just in front of my mother and he stopped her and he said, how dare you, a Christian young woman, work for these dirty Jews because he saw that I was a little boy, blonde, blue-eyed, he didn't, that paid no attention, but I was wearing, you know, clothes like a little Jewish boy. I had payers and my mother, of course, didn't. My mother didn't answer, she didn't say a word and we went straight across to the other side. And from that time on, often when she saw somebody that she thought was going to accost us, we would cross the road. So I remember crisscrossing roads instead of going in a straight line. So that's basically the type of antisemitism that I remember. But basically, I don't remember too much of it. You know, I didn't feel any specific one. My family were winemakers in Poland for over 400 years. My father was a winemaker, my grandfather was a winemaker, and the firm was called Złote Grono, which means golden grape. It had people, concessionaires, all over Poland, and they used to sell our wine all over the country. My father often spoke about wanting to go to Palestine, you know, where we had vineyards. But of course, in Poland, before the war, if you were a Hasidic person, you listened to your father, and your father, grandfather, that's how it went, that's how it went. You didn't go against the wishes. 1938, my grandfather went for the last time to Palestine. And then he sold the, the vineyards. The reason why he sold the vineyards is because he saw young women, Jewish young women, working in the fields, cutting the vines, and doing generally work in the vineyards. They were shorts and short sleeves, and he called them loose women because, you know, they weren't modest, and, and therefore it was, a, it was a travesty as far as he was concerned. And because it was that, he said, we must not go to Palestine, and we must wait for the Messiah to come, and only then will it be okay to go to the land of Israel. Within seven days when the war started, the German army occupied Łódź. Behind the army came the security service, the Gestapo and the SS. And one of the first things they did is they had lists 
of notable Christian Jewish rabbis, doctors, uh, priests, anybody that they thought would be a problem for them in the future. They were the ones who were being arrested. Nobody knew why they were being arrested, but they were being arrested. Eventually, what, what was happening in the lodge was really terrible because immediately also they started these new rules. There were rules for Jews couldn't take train, they couldn't go to public parks, they couldn't t draw more than a hundred zloty or, or whatever a week out of the bank account. Their bank's account were frozen. If you had a little shop, if you were a tailor, or if you had a factory, or whatever you had had to be Aryanized. You had to uh, so-called hand it over to somebody else. Uh, they were terrorizing. They, they started terrorizing. And this was like within several weeks of, of the war. Around about the end of 1939, it was decided by my father that my mother and the two children should actually go and live in, with my aunt in Warsaw because he felt it would be safer uh, that we should live in Warsaw. And of course, we were blonde and we were blue-eyed. So, and my mother was very beautiful and she looked very Christian, so did we. So they cut off my pears and we went to the station because Jews couldn't travel anymore by public transport, they couldn't go to gardens, they couldn't do anything just about. And we actually bought tickets as Christians, got onto the train, and we lived in that apartment for several months until my father arrived from Wurz. It was early in the morning, around about nine o'clock, and we were still covered in, you know, it was very cold. The windows had been broken during bombardment of the Warsaw. So they were covered with blankets and papers, and we were really shivering. So we were always lying on the uh, duvets, either either downs, and trying to keep warm. And suddenly there was a knock on the door, and the, the door was open. Some, some people were dressed, obviously, and three Gestapo men came in. And one of them took out a revolver, and he told us, once we were all in, in the room, that we must get undressed, naked, immediately. So we undressed, and he was shaking the revolver in our, in our face and said, you must now stand against the wall with your hands up and not turn around. If anybody turns around, we are going to shoot that person. So just don't turn around. They went through the whole apartment. We were standing there for quite a while, with our, with, with naked, with our, with our hands in the air, and until, and until they finished, we were standing there. Once they had finished, obviously, the one who had the revolver in his hand said, "I'm going to stand at the door, and until I bang the door that, and we leave, you're not to turn around. The moment somebody turns around, I'm going to shoot you." And then the door banged, and they left. And then we found that they went and robbed us of everything they could find of any value. And this was something that was happening continuously in the Warsaw Ghetto at the end of 39, beginning of 1940, and right for quite a while. You could, you know, you could go, to, a Jew was, was Hefke Pefke, you know, you could do what you like with him. The moment the Nazis came into Warsaw, a Jew became like a hunted animal. Narevki was a very long street. First of all, it was always a very Jewish street. It was part of the Jewish area. And my mother, in the beginning, uh, she had a little window. And in that window, she stood and she used to sell cigarettes, one cigarette, one sweet, because people didn't have any money. So 
uh, along somewhere along this along this street, which was quite a long Jewish street. A lot of Jews lived here, and and fortunately, my father found this this little apartment in Nalevki Street, so that when the ghetto was proclaimed, we were actually living in the ghetto. And I spent a lot of time in the street while I was in the ghetto, going up and down, watching people, watching people dying in the street, watching people, uh, you know, singing, and, and they used to sing, you know, Yiddish songs to try and get children begging, uh, the burial society, you know, taking people to the cemetery where they dug this huge pit. And then there was the cafes, where you stood outside, where they were, you know, roasting geese, and the black marketeers and the Jewish Gestapo, the Chernaska, and, 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 and all these people that had still maybe some money. And this all went on in Nalevki Street, all Nalevki Street. So this was a very important street once upon a time. And what is now left is just a tiny little bit, which was left over, and they called it the street of the heroes of the ghetto, Litsa Bohaterov Ghetto. So that's all that is left. So what you're seeing here, is something that once upon was teeming with Jewish life before the war, during the ghetto time, and now it's gone. It's gone like the Jews are gone. I, I really don't think that I miss anything. Because, well, it's not quite true, because what, what, what I miss is I miss my father and my mother and my sister. But they were, they were here for like, from beginning of 19, almost 1940, sometimes in January or February 1940, to you know, May of 1943. And we lived in a tiny little place, and that's where the wine was made, that's where the little colors my mother used to bake to sell. And that's where for six or eight months she had this little window where she used to sell these little krufki. Now, so these are memories, but they don't, they don't mean very much to me. What means to me is pre-war. You see, I would have liked to recreate what what was in Lodge, what was the pre-war existence, what was the shtibl, what was the children, what was the way my grandfather used to make matzah for the whole family. The baker used to give him half a day where we all ran backwards. Everybody was busy making the matzah shmura for the first night and my grandfather used to distribute to the whole family. Those are the things that are meaningful to me. Those are the things that mean something. This just means horror and, and void. It just almost like I would like it not to be there. That part of, of my life, that part, I, would, I wish it wasn't there. So I can't say I miss anything that was here before. I used to get up in the morning often and I used to run out into the street and I used to just look. And I was almost like, a, like, like what you're doing now. I was filming, but the film was here. It was, it, it was, on, 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 it was in, on my brain, you know. And, and I was filming with my eyes were the lenses. And my brain was the actual camera that was recording everything that I was seeing while I was watching. On Yom Kippur of 1942, we were in an attic in Warsaw. And my father and a lot of other men, we were being hiding because at that time there was the Kocho, where there was a huge uh, uh, deportation, where everybody was supposed to go down, and all the factory owners, the Germans, wanted to have selections who was going to live and who was going to die. My father, of course, hid us, but, but we were in an attic behind false walls, and we were actually davening on Yom Kippur. My father took his talus and took it like this, and he held me to his right. He had a big Hasidic talus, 
and he put, took it round like that and he held it and, I, and he held me like this. So when I go to my synagogue today and I daven on Yom Kippur called Nidra night, I am not in the Kiev Shul in Toronto. I am in an attic in Warsaw in 1942. A little boy, where his father is holding him and trying to save him. So this is what I, happens to me often. Different things happen, but especially on Yom Kippur, I am in an attic. I'm not on the Bima in the Kiev Shul on Yom Kippur in Toronto. I'm in Warsaw, in an attic, in a Lefki number 49 hiding from the Germans and praying and davening for salvation. Of course, the walls were guarded from three power-sharing groups by gendarmes, German gendarmes with rifles, Polish police who had also arms, the, the, the blue police, and the Jewish police who had batons. And, and they, some of them took great pride. I've seen Jewish policemen beating old men and women in the street just because they felt like it or because they were in a bad mood. I mean, I don't know what happened. I was a child, I couldn't understand it. Logically, you know, I just watched it. I just observed it and recorded it so that I can tell you now what happened. But basically, that, those were the three kind of tiers of guards that watched the, the walls. And if you, if you actually were found on the other side, they would shoot you. The wall, you know, enclosed us, grabbed us, and we were like chicken in a coop. When, when they started the ghetto, each building had to have a caretaker appointed by the Judenrat. And they would pay him the fees and he would be in charge. And he had, to, he had almost like police uh, uh, powers. Uh, he could do lots of things. Uh, but so together with him and some of the other people, they started digging underneath the ruins of the building that was destroyed, and they started preparing a bunker right underneath the earth. And uh, on the 19th of April, we actually went down to the bunker and we were there for nearly three weeks. That evening, when shooting when the, the, the uprising really started, when the last remnants of the city of 50 or 40,000 Jews that were left were going to be taken to be murdered, we had a Seder in the bunker. It's, it's something that reminds me of a very dark uh, place because it was almost like the beginning of the end. You know, I mean, we were fighting for a whole, almost a whole year from, from, from July to April to be hidden, not to be caught. And now it was the end. We, we, had, we were lying in a bunker. We didn't know what was going on. Either in the end of the first week of May or beginning of the second week of May, suddenly there was sounds coming through the air vents in kind of guttural German saying we know that you are in this bunker we know exactly where the trapdoor is uh, you have half an hour to come out repeat it in Polish and in German and if you don't come out we're going to throw gas bombs and you're all going to die I was very proud of the fact that when we came out, there was these German 
Nazi paratroopers with their helmets and their smocks and their machine guns on, uh, across their chest and shouting all the time, Hände hoch, nicht schießen, Hände hoch, nicht schießen. Put your arms up, don't shoot, don't shoot. And I thought, they're scared of us. They're scared of us. And I had this feeling of, of, of pride suddenly coming, you know, floating into me. We, first of all, we were lying down on the ground and they were waiting, I think, to put together a big column from other places they called. And then when there was a lot of people, quite a large group, and we were walking in the road and buildings were burning on both sides. So we were walking in the middle with two walls of fire. And I, after, after the war, many years after the war, when I started having nightmares, I remembered that some people were running away from the column and almost running into, towards the fire. And the Nazi troopers and the Ukrainian guards were raffing their heads off, taking off the rifle and shooting, uh, not even aiming, just shooting because they thought to myself, what's the difference? They're going to die anyway. And, and, and then I had this concurrent dream and this nightmare which I used to wake, wake up screaming, being chased into the fire and being shot and dying in, in that place. discovered in a bunker around about the end of the first week or the beginning of the second week in May and then we were chased to the Umschlagplatz. We spent two nights and a day. On the second day in the morning they started chasing us out. Uh, they actually uh, were standing with clubs and rifle butts and they hitting, they were hitting you, schnell, schnell, lauf, and the dogs were barking and they pushed us in and they pushed us into these wagons and they pushed in as many people as possible. In other words, you, you, you couldn't, you, you could only, you could stand but hardly stand because you were like squashed, like sardines in a can. It was terrible. And my parents, created almost like a little, they surrounded me with their hands and, and my sister, so they guarded us so that we shouldn't be squashed. In feelings, it was like an eternity. And then when we got to uh, Majdanek and they opened the, 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 the doors of the, of, the, of the wagons and we came out, quite a few people that were taken out of the wagons were put on the side because they were dead. And that's how we got from the Umschlagplatz to Majdanek. We came here to this field here, which was actually all sand. And then they started separating men from women, children who were running around without parents, they put them to one side. And then uh, the women with children were separate. And my father told me that I must stay with him and I must, if they asked me, I must say that they, he, I'm 18 years old. Suddenly, my sister, who had been separated from my mother and who was pushed towards the children, and I saw her standing there, she must have seen my mother. So she ran away from the children and ran towards my mother, and she took her around and started hugging her. My mother was holding her like this. And that is the last time that I actually saw my mother, but from my sister. When, once she started hugging my mother, from all I saw was that blonde, beautiful braid that she had, that, and I saw it when she was running towards my mother, 
and I can't remember her face. I cannot remember anything, not even from childhood. It's almost like disappeared from my, my, my mind, my brain has completely blotted out anything to do with my sister. So I can't see her body, I don't know what she looked like, I don't know what her face looked like. So whenever I think of Sabina, my sister, my twin sister, all I see is her braid. And it really kills me because it's, it's such a sad thing that somebody who was I mean, we were twins. We grew up together, not in our mother's womb. And from that time, we were hardly ever separated until we came to this place here. And since, since that time, I just can't see her. I don't know what she looks like. Then we chased us into the barrack and then they told us to undress naked. There were trestles inside, you know, wooden trestles standing. And that's where we had to throw our clothes, any belongings, everything that you had to be thrown in there. And once, once we had completely naked, they started chasing us. You know, again, we were chased run, running with our hands in, naked in our, in, in, up, up in the air. And then we, when we arrived, we arrived to this place here where there were these baths or these, these big holes filled with water. And we had to jump in into the water. And if you didn't jump in, and they told us to completely go under. And if you, if you didn't put your head under, a couple was standing there with a, with a piece of wood or something, uh, and, and he would knock you over the head uh, uh, that you should go under. And then when you came out, your eyes, all your orifices in your body, every, every, every orifice was burning. I mean, it was such, such strong uh, disinfectant that every, uh, your whole body was just like burning. We ran into this room and there were showers, shower heads, and I was sure that this is a guest chamber because we knew in the Warsaw Ghetto that, you know, that you come in, you see these shower heads, but in actual fact, you know, you, you die there, you're going, guest is going to come out and you're going to die. So I said, my Israel, I didn't see my father, but I was in that room surrounded by many, many men, all naked, standing and some of them saying prayers and some of them just, I don't know. I mean, it was com it's completely mad what was, what was in that room. But suddenly water came out of these shower heads. And so we were drenched with water. And then after we kind of like, they didn't give us anything to dry yourself. We were running out. And when we ran out, we went into a barrack where there were benches and, 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 and uh, uh, prisoners actually were standing there uh, behind and they were handing out these, uh, you, these um, prison clothes with the striped you know, prison clothes and we got a hat and we got a, 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 a jacket and trousers and wooden cloaks and then they chased us out outside and they, made, and they started counting us. When I ran out and uh, I was already closed I started looking for my father and I didn't see him. So I, I, I saw a man who used to come to our apartment in the Warsaw Ghetto. My father used to bring him to sleep there at night and I saw him, so I ran up to him and I asked him, did you see my father? Where's my father? Because I was looking for him all over the place. And he didn't answer. He just lifted his eyes to heaven and and and, and and walked away. He just lifted his eyes to heaven. And then I knew that my father was not alive anymore. I cried. I, I was 11 years old. Can you imagine what it means to walk and look at these shoes? And remembering that your parents, my father, my mother, my sister, died here, murdered here, and possibly the shoes they wore are actually amongst this lot here. And I can't see them. It's terrible.
terrible the feeling that one has looking at these shoes or all the human beings you know that died in this place and all that's left is rotting shoes You know, for me, a Hasidic Jewish boy brought up as a Jew with Chia Samesim, where it is so important to be buried, the Keve Yisruel, to come here and to look at these horrific ovens where the murdered victims of Jews were burned and where my parents and my sister were burned in these ovens. You cannot imagine what kind of unbelievable feelings of <sighs> I'm a humanitarian person, but at this particular moment, I feel so angry against the perpetrators of this deed that I don't know what I would be capable of doing without really wanting to. It's inconceivable that such things should happen in a world, in a normal human world. You know, when I found myself alone, my, my young, undeveloped brain shut off. And I remember purely at that time trying to almost make myself invisible. I was just almost in like in a cocoon. I switched off. So this would happen when this little boy of 11, you know, kind of came out of here he came out a different human being as he was up to the time where he had his father and his mother and his sister. And his sister that he forgot that he doesn't know what she looks like. In Maidanek, they were very conscious of, of cleanliness and, and, and everything had to be organized and, and 100%. So in front of the blocks there were little flowers, like a little garden at the entrance, kind of round thing, surrounded with white stones, making a kind of uh, garden. And as I went out, I lay down on all fours and I started putting the, bone, the stones and then fiddling with the flowers and putting in, taking flowers in, putting them out. And I think they got used to it. Either the Blockhelter or the Stubendis and the people around, they got used to me lying there and fiddling with the flowers and this. And this is how I used to hide, you know, to try and make yourself invisible. Because the most important thing in Maidanek is make yourself invisible. While I was doing this, a couple who I'd never seen before, but I can see him now because I've never forgotten his face, shouted at me and said, while I was like lying with my tuchus up and my, like an animal with my, on all fours, shouted at me, what are you doing here? Was machst du hier? So I said, I have a you know, I told him, you know, I was told that, that this is what I must do. I must, I must clean up and make sure that the front is beautiful and plant flowers and look after the stones and, and just make sure the entrance is clean and go around and clean up any dirt. And without saying a word, he started hitting me, but beating me with his boots. He had pointed boots. He, had, he wore a short black kind of uh, three-quarter coat and he wore a hat with a, with a, with a plastic thing, and he had his red arm burned couple and things like that, and he started hitting me. And he was hitting me in my backside. And he hit, it, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me, and I started actually bleeding. And then he just walked away. Yeah. And to this day, I, after the war, 
I had three operations, and to this day, I still suffer from that beating that I had here in my daddy. And then there were selections on a daily basis, or no, we never knew when the selections were going to be. There was a selection, and I stepped out. And then when, and a lot, quite a few people stepped out, and some were actually taken out. They were asked, what are you, what are you, and they were taken out. And we went to a barrack. We were waiting there. We still didn't know what was going on. The next thing is, we were marched to the station, and we were put into wagons, given food, bread, a sausage, piece of cheese, and water, and we, we, there was plenty of room in, 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 in the wagons. We could sit on the floor, and we were sent to Skarzysko. After the selection in Majdanek for work, we went into wagons and we didn't know where we were going to go, but we arrived in this place, which was called Skarzysko Kamienne. Today there is nothing. All that you see here is the forest. This, the other side, on the other side of this forest, was a clearing, and that's where I spent a lot of my time. It was called the Shenitsa, the firing uh, area, where we used to dispose of these casings of the, so that they could be, you know, re kind of uh, made into new casings or into metal or whatever. And, and this is where I worked most of the time. The population here worked making ammunition for the German army. They made grenades, they made mines with the picric acid, uh, they made uh, anti-aircraft ammunition. The work was unbelievably difficult, especially the ones, the people that worked making those mines and what they called granati, because it, it was, it, you, you couldn't exist for more than two or three months uh, if you worked with those things. If you work with others, also many, many people died here because they died of hunger and died of disease. There was typhoid, there were selections, there were uh, um, hunger. I mean, if you didn't have anybody to help you to have some extra food, you were dying of hunger because the food that they gave you was not enough. What happened? I got typhoid and I went to work and my friends used to help me, so they kind of almost like carried me to work so that I shouldn't be in the barrack, because if you were left in the barrack and they found you in the barrack, they would take you to the hospital, and hospital was the anteroom of death. So for a few days I walked, but there came the third, fourth day when I had this crisis, and I just couldn't lift my legs, I couldn't walk. And there was no way anybody could help me, because I was so helpless, I was burning with fever, uh, there were no medications whatsoever, so you either lived or you died. But my friends put me on the top bunk and they covered me with straw and they thought, well, with God's help, maybe we'll see what happened because I just, there was no way I could walk. So around about when everybody left for works, the Jewish policeman would come with the Ukrainian Werkschutz. He opened the door and he went in and the Ukrainian that was with him stood at the door. And possibly he was scared to go in because, you know, typhoid was, was, there was a lot of typhoid going. So maybe they were then scared to go in. So the Jewish policeman, he went from, you know, from row of, 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 of bunks to row of bunks, stood on the first to look on top, came to mine, stood on the first bunk, looked at me into my eyes and shouted, Keine da. Nobody's here. And the Ukrainian didn't come in, and he left. The next day, my 
shift changed to night shift. And for night shift, I worked in the, with the, women, in the women's factory. And when I, worked, when I went to the women's factory, first of all, it was easier. Secondly, I, the work wasn't so hard. And I, I only had to deliver the black powder, which they would put in into the uh, casings. And it, was, it, was, it, wasn't very, it wasn't very hard work. But what they did is they didn't allow me to work. They would put me in a corner. And there were Jewish foremen and Jewish policemen and the German Wachmeisters, you know, Arbeitsmeister, the, the people who were the engineers in charge, they would go up and down. So whenever any one of those was coming near to where I was, they would go, so something, we, they made up a word and I would get up and I would be pouring something into a, in one of these chests where the black powder, where I was supposed to then carry it. And when they went away, I would be. And let me tell you now what happened in the end. We went to work, we came back, the camp was surrounded, and there were not only the Werkschutz, but there were also Nazi SS with machine guns. The camp was surrounded. And then we went to sleep. The next morning, we woke up. They chased us out of the barrack. We didn't go to work. And they, we were standing in a roll call on an appel. And after standing there for a while, Schulz was our German, he was actually an Austrian inspector, police inspector who joined the, I don't know, Gestapo, I don't know, before the war. And he was our commander, the Werksre commander. So we knew immediately that this is actually a selection for death. Because we looked around, people who were yellow, people who were in rags like I was, these were all being called out. The others looked quite the good ones, you know, the ones that, you know, who were reasonably well. So we started running. We started running because nobody was guarding us at the time. We just started running. We were standing on the other side. Started running because you don't want to die. So I first jumped into a chest where the dead bodies were lying. So I jumped out of this chest where I was lying, you know, with the dead people. And I buried myself underneath the barrack, which was on stilts, trying to hide. Of course, the Werkschutz and the Jewish police decided by commander, by the command, that they must get everybody together and have a new appell because he had so many people he was going to shoot and he had a list of, six, of people. So if he had 500, nobody was going to answer their name anymore. So they started running looking for people. And my luck was that the person who found me was Katz pulled me out and he said, listen, you can't hide, but I'm going to help you. He took me into the barrack and he, first of all, took all my rags away. I had paper on my feet with, with, with wire because I had no shoes anymore. My shoes had finished long time ago and we walked around that in the snow in the winter. And, and we used to have packed, you know, in the two, from the cold, we used to take whatever, you know, from the chemical uh, uh, paper, from the sex of the chemicals, we used to try and, and, and fill it out around us to keep warm. So, but I was in rags. So he took everything off, he washed me, he combed my hair. My hair had grown back from the time that I was in Maidanek, it was a year later. And he gave me completely new clothes, took his dead wife's leftover lipstick and he rubbed it into my cheeks. Rubbed it in my cheeks so my cheeks should be, you know, look, look healthy. And he gave me a hat, police boots. I was dressed like a human being. And he said, go out, with God's help, you'll survive the selection because there's going to be a selection now. He's going to choose whatever people he's got on the list. He's going to have to shoot if it's 400 or 500. So we had a new appell. Everybody was found. We had a new appell. We're standing, and he went from row to row without names, and he just pulled out people, pulled out people, pulled out people. And on the other side, there was now a ring where Jewish police and Werkschutz were standing, surrounding those people condemned to death. And if anybody tried to run away, they would shoot after them and they would kill them. So this was the story of what was going on. Schultz gone from row to row, 
My best friend, Yaakov, stood next to me. He was in rags, like I was before. Schultz came towards us. We were in the front row because nobody wanted to stand in the front row. The youngest and the weakest were being pushed to the front row because you didn't know who you're going to choose. Schultz didn't stop in front of him. He stopped in front of me, looked at me for an eternity, didn't take me. I was sure he recognized me or something he was going to take me. Put his hand without looking, took Yaakov and pushed him. Of course, immediately a policeman came and took him into this ring where they were surrounded. And for years and years and years, I suffered enormous guilt because for me, he was a korban. He was a sacrificial lamb. Somebody who, he, he, Schultz was looking at me, but he took him. So it was almost like a, a, a stone that was lying on my, on my heart. And, and it was something, whenever I thought about it, whenever I, I dreamt about it, it was an extremely difficult uh, uh, thing. And when I told it the first time, I was really, you know, beside myself because I, I, I could, I, I just could understand. It, it was worse than what when I lo lost my parents or my sister because we were so close for a whole year in that camp. I stayed in this camp for a whole year and at the end I was sent from here by the same company, Hasak, which owned these factories, Hugo Schneider Aktiengesellschaft, to Chestochova. As the Russian forces were coming near to Chenstochova, you know, working camp where I was working for the yeah, ironworks for the for Hasak, uh, they deported us back somewhere. We didn't know where. So one day we were taken out of the camp and we were put into truck cars, railway cars, and uh, we were first of all we were standing there for a couple of days. Then suddenly a few SS men arrived and they sealed the, the train, and we traveled, I don't know, a couple of days maybe, and we arrived here in this place in Buchenwald. As we arrived, you know, the doors opened and the same thing like in Maidanek. There was the shouting and the schnell and raus and, and the dogs were shouting and, and the shooting in the air. They weren't killing anybody. They, they were just, it was just, they were furious. The place was terrible. It was unbelievable. You just, it was like living in, in hell, in a Dantesque hell. That's what it, it reminded you. Because you didn't know from minute to minute what's gonna happen to you. You, you were fighting for survival. You didn't have friends here. I mean, in, in Czestochowa I had friends, in Skarzysko I had friends. We helped each other. Here, it, it was just like, you know, rats. It was like rats in, in running and eating each other. That's what it was. I don't think you can imagine what this place was like in, in, in towards the end of 1944, beginning of 1945. It was hell on earth. Can, can you imagine going to sleep and waking up in the morning with, with dead bodies and then being called out on a, on a pelt, standing there, and then having all these kind of like logs of wood stuck up next to you, which are being counted, so you make sure that everybody is there and then being carted into crematorium. It was almost like a nightmare. The whole, the whole time I was here, it was like a nightmare. Uh, 
this thing is that um, you got a, mm. a kind of protection uh, in foam. But I think this is the, the one yeah. that, the that actually is the most important because this gives the, the uh, you know, an effect also, which is very unusual because it says the, that I was verhaftet durch, durch the RSHA. And it also says political Polish Jude and I had a P with a, a tri red triangle, no yellow. Yes. That's also unusual. Yes, unusual as well. No, no, normally it was yellow, yellow and red, mm -hmm. and, but no P on it. When new arrivals used to come, they were kept in this area, which was separated from the big camp, the original camp where prisoners were held here. And my block, according to the records, was in this place here. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was block 63. And we were chased in, in these barracks and there were over, I mean, I remember about a thousand in my barrack. And the existence was, was too terrible. This tower that you see from here was quite infamous because we were told that when somebody is called to the tower, it means bad things. In other words, either they were going to go to executions or something is going to happen to them. So we were always fearful when somebody was called to the tower. And then suddenly started names uh, being called out to the tower. And that was sometimes in the beginning in January of 1945, our names were being called. All, all those people that came from Częstochowa, the Hasak, they started calling out a, a lot of the names, and one of the names was mine. So we were going to the tower, but we didn't know what was going to happen. But fortunately for us, they took us onto the trucks, railway trucks, and they sent us to the factory in Kolditz, which belonged to Hasak. And this was basically, in a way, it was like being liberated, because if we stayed here, I don't believe we could have survived. And this really terrible place. It was really unbelievable to think that anybody could have survived here in 1945 in the, in the small camp. When we arrived in Kolditz, we had a roll call. The SS that were guarding us were old men. They were grandfathers. They, I mean, they were not dressed, you know, in kind of fancy like some of these SS, you know, their uniforms. They had old uh, rifles. The rifles didn't look machine guns. And uh, they took us into a huge building, a, a factory building, a, a hall and they made us stand on, on a roll call in the hall. And inside uh, a Oberschafira, which was the kind of in charge of, of our work or whatever, uh, he, after everybody was standing in, in, in rows of five or whatever, he said, ob eine kleine Buben is da, da muss ein Aussteigen. It means that if any youngsters are here, they must please step out. For some reason, you know, with God's help, I don't know, it made me, I went out, I stood out, I was standing there all on my own while he was giving instruction to the rest of the, of, of the roll call to everybody else. He took me by the hand and took me to the SS kitchen and he said to me, du wirst du arbeiten, you are going to work here. But he also did something else, he took a, a bag and he said, I'm putting that in that corner there, you see that corner, I'm going to put it there and nobody must see you and you are going to take every day put, as much as you can put fill up this with potatoes and carrots whatever you can find of food you must put it there and i was treated quite well i was you know i was given extra food in the kitchen and and this re really built up my strength and we were here for i would say a couple of months january february towards the end of march the americans were coming towards 
So they were evacuating everybody to go, I don't know where they were going to take us. And, and, and you know, they started marching us out. While we were walking in Germany itself and walking through little towns like Kolditz or others, uh, the, the local population were throwing stones at us, shouting and vilifying us. And then we crossed the border. As we crossed the border into Czechoslovakia, suddenly from the windows, food started coming down. They saw prisoners walking and they threw food down. And our escort started shooting in the air and shouting at them that if they don't stop it, they're going to shoot into their windows. We left Kolditz on our march and we arrived in Trezenstadt two and a half weeks later. When we arrived in Trezenstadt from Kolditz on the death march, the first thing I, I, that happened to me is I lay in the corner there by a column and somebody came up and gave me a piece of bread and sausage and that was the first real food that I got in approximately two and a half weeks of our death march. After being here for about 10 days, maybe uh, eight days, I don't remember exactly how long, on the 8th of May, we were liberated by the Russians. I was one of the few who could actually run out and see what was going on. We ran out and we saw Russian troops going, you know, marching towards wherever they were marching. But also we saw a lot of uh, Germans being expelled from Czechoslovakia uh, old women, uh, young women with children, old men, really very miserable in carts and, and, and crying and being abused. Heat, they're abused and, 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 and robbed by whoever wanted to do that. They, they really were. And, and, and it evoked in me a kind of empathy. I, was, I felt so sorry for these people because I really felt, you know, it looked as like the Jews were going to the ghetto. Was all, they were suffering just as much as I did. And they were human beings. So to me, as a human being, I felt for other human beings. While I was watching uh, the, this, these things happening, I noticed that in the field, across the road, were standing two horses spanned into a platform, you know, one of, a flat platform. And I started walking towards it, and there was nobody around. And I remembered, you know, running and driving in horses in my grandfather's farm in Vielun. So it wasn't foreign to me. So I got on, and I sat on, the, on that front there where, the, where you sit to, I took the reins, and I said, Vio, and the horses started to move. So I drove into, back to the ghetto, and for the next few days or a week, I went around the villages, I went to Lito Maritza, to the farms, and I actually was scrounging food for my friends. After a while, somebody came up to me and he said, do these horses belong to you and this wagon? And I said, yes. He says, we would like you to work for us. And the work that I did was take food to the Kleinefesting, to the prisoners that were imprisoned by the Russians in in the prison there in the Kleine Festung. And I conveyed, I became like a contractor and I actually got salaries for it. And then after three months, they told us that we have to leave here, that we were going to go to England. So I spoke to this guy who was in charge of my unit or whatever. I said, what about the horses? I want to take the horses with me. So he said, no, you can't take the horses. You're going to go by aeroplane to England. You can't take the horses with you. 
So I said, well, I'm not going. And I started crying, you know. A boy of 13, 14, if he can't get what he wants, he starts crying. So I started crying. And this guy had a brilliant idea. He said, look, horses can't go in airplanes. So we can't send it to you in airplane. But I promise you that we are going to send it by boat. So when you get to England, you'll get a note from us when the horses come and then you can go and collect them. That was the end of me ever seeing those horses ever again. <laughs> The main purpose of why I teach and speak about the Holocaust and spend time with students, postgraduate, educators and others is because I feel that by spreading the word of what happened and what can happen at any time, at any place, amongst any people, is something that I, by speaking to them, maybe open their eyes to see that maybe it can be avoided. That tolerance and accepting the other human being as somebody who is not necessarily like you, not of the same culture, but that his culture is always is worth the same as your culture. And I leave them, I say, look, I carry the torch of what happened, but I also carry the torch of tolerance. And I'm handing that to torch over to you that you should do exactly the same thing. You should remember what I told you, what could happen, what had happened, and what can happen in the future, but you should try and keep the torch of tolerance and spread that so that it shouldn't happen again. Dort nicht weit. Dort wie der Umschlagplatz dort steigt, dort wie man stirbt sich in der Brei und die Wagonen. Dort wie ein Kind schreit zu der Mama, oi Mama, lass mich nicht allein, ich will gehen mit dir zusammen. Schweig, Kinder, schweig, schwelbele. Sorg mit euch, als du bist ein I, weil Brüder, Schwester, Tante, Mama, voren alle zum Samen, voren alle zum Versammen. Schusch, mein Darling, Schall, Schusch, mein Lieferhaft, du Nottel, der Tier. 